Welcome back, everyone, to this second session of the uh, Humane Philosophy Project Aquinas Institute Conference on Morning. Uh, now, uh, as, I show you, as I'm sure you know, one of the things we wanted to do with this conference is to have the topic of morning approached from a range of different, uh, different disciplines and intellectual backgrounds. And uh, I know Mikawai uh, intends ultimately to produce a collection of essays which will uh, expand even further into areas that haven't come up today. Uh, and uh, he will compose a great synthetic introduction to this, which, which will weave together all these different ideas and give the last word on, on this topic. Um, so we've already had a, a theological and a psychological uh, uh, approach to this topic this morning, or early this afternoon, rather. Uh, however, this doesn't make our next speaker very easy to introduce. Uh, the Humane Philosophy Project has had the honor of having Raymond Tallis speak for us once before, and then I think it was right to say that he had his philosopher's hat on. However, as someone supremely distinguished in such a wide range of areas, I, I think it might be the case today that he just has his polymathematical hat on. <laughs> Nonetheless, Raymond Tallis was a professor of geriatric medicine at the University of Manchester until 2006. He's published over 200 articles in leading journals, including uh, Nature, Medicine, and Lancet. In 2000, he was elected a fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences. And in addition to uh, literary works, he's published many books on philosophy of mind, philosophical anthropology, literary theory, the nature of art, and cultural criticism. Uh, recent books include uh, Aping Mankind, Neuromania, Darwinitis, and the Misrepresentation of Humanity in 2011, and In Defense of Wonder and Other Philosophical Reflections in, in 2012. And I know he's currently working on a great magnum opus on the philosophy of time, which uh, I myself am extremely excited about as someone interested in that area. But today, he's going to talk to us about the difficult art of outliving. So please give a very warm introduction, or welcome, to Raymond Tallis. Mm -hmm. uh, Ralph, that was such a lovely introduction that the sensible thing now would be for me to drop dead, so your, ex <laughs> so your expectations would not fall during the course of my talk. It's very nice to meet the gang again of Ralph, M Sam, and Mikolai, and thank you very much indeed for involving me in this Humane Philosophy Project. I think it was the fourth century Bishop Donatus, and I know I'm surrounded by people who know much more about these individuals than I do, who said, curse be those who make our remarks before us. And I have to say that not only have my remarks been made in advance, but actually everything I'm going to say has been summarized brilliantly by Colin in one aphorism, which is basically that grief is the price we pay for love. And I guess that is absolutely central to Colin's thinking, and it's central to the talk that follows. Um, we are at a philosophy meeting, and so we begin thinking about philosophers. And in the Apology, Socrates is attributed the view by his ventriloquist Plato that the aim of philosophy should be to teach one not so much how to live as how to die. And of course, he was echoed by Cicero, to philosophize is to learn how to die. Now, this needs qualification. As a doctor who's witnessed many deaths, I think philosophy has very little to offer once the process gets going. Socrates himself was famously able to think on a snowy battlefield, and Wittgenstein had some of his deepest thoughts after his prostate cancer had proved to be no longer amenable to treatment. But generally, philosophy has little to offer us in the spaces defined by pain, breathlessness, incontinence, helplessness, nausea, or confusion. So while philosophy as we understand it in the Western tradition has little to say to us on our deathbed, might it nevertheless help us help to teach us about death? or enhance our awareness of finitude, notwithstanding that our days have for most of our life no visible boundary. If so, at its most profound, the philosophy committed to the art of dying is inseparable from sharpening, committed to the art of living is inseparable from sharpening our awareness of dying. It was Martin Heidegger, of course, who contrasted authentic being towards death with all inauthentic being that was lost in the they with the unreflecting acceptance of a public consciousness, of what we, or what they, or we as they, or one think, expressed in Gassing or Gareda. But of course, he's not the most inspiring example in his person, 
given that he was at least an initially willing fellow traveller with one of the wickedest regimes in history and turned a willfully blind eye to the Holocaust. And perhaps a more compelling witness is Montaigne, whose essays express an early phenomenological approach to philosophy. Let us banish the strangeness of death, he says. Let us practice it, accustom ourselves to it, never having anything so often present in our minds than death. Let us always keep the image of death in full view. And behind this is, I suspect, the belief expressed by E.M. Forster that while death destroys a man, or indeed a woman, the idea of death saves him or her. Saves him? Talk of salvation exaggerates the power of just thinking about death. And it seems much more convincing in a lecture theatre in broad daylight, surrounded by one's fellows, than it does in solitary insomnia at 3 a.m., when the ticking of the bedroom clock suggests an insatiable mandible attached to a mindless universe defoliating the world. Even so, to live to the full, one must be constantly aware of the transience of things and import death into life, import dateless and indeed dateless night into a Thursday afternoon. Now, the traditional preoccupations of philosophy, the nature of reality, stuff of the world, nature of space and time, the origin and limits of our knowledge, the place of the mind in the cosmos, serve to highlight through these mysteries the life that death cancels. But all of this is by way of preliminary, because my talk, a response to the advertised theme of the meeting, mourning, is about something that's between the art of living and the art of dying, namely the art of outliving. And I'm going to briefly return to the question of philosophy at the very end. Now, my comments in this talk are not only merely preliminary, they're also prolegomenal, because I'm not going to do philosophy, but describe a challenge which philosophy needs to co confront if it's going to do its work of assisting us to flourish through enhancing our awareness of the mystery of a life which is tragic as well as fathomless. I have to confess that when I began writing this talk, I thought I knew what I was going to say. Now, having written it, I am less sure of my destination, except insofar that I have not arrived at it. But that's confidential. <laughs> now, when we think of mourning, mourning for that we have loved and outlived, we quite properly focus on bereavement. And I'll come to that in a while. But first, I want to examine the more general intertwining of life and death. It is so pervasive, I shall simply pick up and pull out a few trailing threads. Your speaker, at the age of 69, is a freak of longevity. He has exceeded the life expectancy of most humans over most of history. And his story is consequently one of many modes of outliving. The most obvious are his parents, his grandparents, uncles and aunts, teachers, many colleagues, friends and enemies, heroes he worshipped and villains he abhorred and vilified. But he's also outlived periods of his life, projects that consumed him, enthusiasms and passions, so many sloughed off skins. He has lost his childhood, boyhood, youth, middle age, and the youth of old age. He has outlived his career, the childhood of his children, and seen them too outlive preoccupations, hopes, and dreams. He is a dozen kinds of emeritus. As he has aged, so he has lost possibility. There is less and less open future and more and more determinate past. His life has become more precisely defined by a process of pruning conducted by secateurs with more heads than a hydra. Omnis determinatio est negatio. His choices have closed off the open future of his youth and lock-in or pathway dependency means that he's arrived at a place from which he cannot go backwards. Seen in that light, the CV is less a list of achievements than the building blocks of a prison constructed out of decisions and accidents. Even so, he has been lucky, very lucky, absurdly lucky, he is largely intact. Of all his outlivings, the most profound is the outliving of his earlier selves. His 40-year-old self was a remote descendant of his 10-year-old self. And as for the teenager, he would hardly recognise the elderly gentleman catching surprise sight of himself in a mirror and would probably not be on speaking terms with him. <laughs> Co-evolving with his selves are the successive worlds of beloved or familiar or just ordinary places of officers, of circles of friends, acquaintances and colleagues, imperceptibly or abruptly coming to an end. The vector is often hidden by the cyclical nature of his life, 
the regular renewals of the yearly round, the weekly timetable, the Saturday morning football with the children, successive Christmases and the annual holiday. Hidden or not, behind accumulation and growth, there is a constant counterpoint of loss. The knowledge that life at its most abundant is mixed with death. The flowers of spring wither, the work done. The wrappings from dehiscent buds litter the woodland floor. Our lives always have the sense of being the summer before the dark. And if we fail to notice this, it's only because we're looking forward at our moments of transition. And this is something that sustains us until we, the final phase, when we lose the alibi and the obligations of the future. The underlying story of growing, growing that is growing away, of gain that is lost, becomes evident at certain moments of transition. As when, when, for example, we move out of the family home, gaining freedom and losing our childhood. Or take our own childhood to school for the first time and start the process by which we cease for them to be all and everything. The child who is utterly dependent on you grows up to be an adult who has a world of his own from which he communicates with yours. At such moments, we experience moods in which we outlivers seem exiles from a lost paradise. A. Houseman caught this beautifully. Into my heart, an air that kills, from yon far country blows. What are those blue remembered hills? What spires, what farms are those? That is the land of lost content. I see it shining plain, the happy highways where I went and cannot come again. Now old, we wake at 3 a.m. and remember the sunlit days on the beach with the children and cry with anguish, Vion's immortal lines, where are the snows of yesteryear? Even if we adopt a kind of Whiggish view of our own history, a view perhaps confirmed by looking at old photographs that show us as raw, unformed and with a ridiculous haircut, we know that after we've left our childhood, with its future whose boundaries are invisible, living and losing, living and outliving, are inseparable. Thus the source of the elective sadness, the white melancholy, the sweetness of mourning for the past, simply because it is past, beautiful because bygone and beyond recall. Each outliving moves us perceptibly or imperceptibly closer to death, after which it will be others who will do the outliving, on whose fidelity to our memory we shall rely for our continuing existence. But now it's time to turn to the non-elective, unbeautiful sadness, the crushing grief of bereavement, of a catastrophic loss that ransacks one's life and fills what is left with a miserable hunger for that which has been lost. And in what I say, in what follows, I draw on a grief imagined for myself and the closely observed grief of a good friend who three years on from the sudden loss of his wife is not much further on. He remains close to the calamitous moment when she came into the room and said, I have a terrible headache, and their 40-year-old conversation came to an end. He turns to her to smile, and her face is not there to receive it. He thinks of something he must tell her, but she has nothing to hear it by. He's tormented by dreams in which she's trying to get hold of him by phone. He returns from travelling to what was their home, and he's now the sole owner. In consequence, every space behind the front door, in the kitchen, in the bathroom, in the bedroom, in the unshared bed, in every cupboard where her unoccupied clothes are, is hung with a knot, a knot that evacuates meaning from what he sees, hears, says, thinks and owns. Because there is no remission, her death seems at times a stubbornness, an unending silence, an eternally averted gaze, an infinite sulk. Her death is everywhere, in everything, not least in the eyes of acquaintances who reflect back to him his status as a widower. It no longer matters whether he walked to the right or to the left, because all places are equidistant from the non-existent place where she's still alive. Julian Barnes described this in Levels of Life. He described it as being comparable to losing a limb or an organ. Being a doctor, my friend corrected him. For what he has lost is the interstitial tissue that bounded him together as a coherent entity. Bereavement 24-7. Can things go on like this? Sooner or later, someone's going to say, it's time to let, let go, time to move on. 
the work of grief has been done. Wipe your eyes, look away from the world that is lost to the world that remains. Of course, keep those many anniversaries, keep those special movements, and keep the little box in which the memories are stored. But cultivate for her sake the friendships of those who knew her. But now is the time to look to the future. What good, decent, humane sense. It's what Queen Gertrude, his mother, counselled Hamlet, chiding him for what she, she sees as the excess of his mourning over his dead father. Do not forever with thy veiled eyes seek for thy noble father in the dust. Thou knowst tis common, all that lives must die, passing through nature to eternity. Gertrude's motives for urging good cheer are of course impure. Even so we recognise the sentiment behind the message. At some stage we must get over bereavement and resume our lives. Thus the difficult art of outliving. But there are barriers. Moving on seems like a betrayal. Indeed, several betrayals. It is a self-betrayal. It is to embrace the outliving of something, of that togetherness that filled the vessel of his days. I will get over you, says that at a certain level, <clears throat> there was something essential in me that was outside or beyond the relationship. Something that was left intact when you went out of which I can build a new story, a new life, a new self. It is a self-betrayal to assign the relationship to a past that is past, to say, you will matter less. Miss Havisham's refusal to remove the wedding dress she was wearing when she was jilted at the altar, leaving the wedding breakfast and the wedding cake on the table, having the clock stopped at the moment when she received the letter, is an expression of a profound fidelity to herself. In such a state of mourning, any continuation of ordinary life, even that which is necessary to get from day to day, <coughs> washed, fed, sheltered, and in communication with others, seems almost impious. That he should devote himself to trivia in the vicinity of the gigantic fact of her absence. That he should be pushing a shopping trolley or sorting out a recalcitrant washing machine while she is dissolving in the rain. It's a kind of survivor guilt and it affects the continuation of the long, detailed littleness of daily life after he's failed to save her and can no longer help her. How then to remember and not to be paralysed by memory? How to know, the si to know the size of another's death without being diminished by it? To feel the loss, but not to be eaten from within by it? To pay tribute to the past without mortgaging the future? There is, it seems, no right path between the commemoration of mourning and moving on, and giving the dead their due, their life in his own life. Mourning refuses to say of the past that it is merely past, and that being the past, it is less real than the present. It refuses to say that the loss is a temporary setback. It will not collude with the indifference of the world, of the crowd, of the stranger, of the material universe, in pronouncing the ins insignificance of all that was significant, that that mattering was transient. At the heart of love, after all, is the implicit declaration, you are irreplaceable, you are inseparable from what I am, the days we share are my life. Moving on is an acceptance that nothing, however much it matters, doesn't matter in the end, that all things will pass and it will be as if they have never been. The continuation of the pain, conversely, is a tribute to the reality and depth of relationship. Of course, we try different ways of giving ourselves permission to move on. We do so for the sake of others in our lives, to remain a fully engaged parent of our children, sharing with their joys and sorrows, to put on a brave face for our friends and to become once more the genial companion we thought we once were, and to resume the projects in which they and others had invested so much. And we might even find permission in the imagined wishes of the one who has gone. She would have wished me to find happiness. There is an example in a beautiful because honest letter from Charles Dickens to his younger sister, Letitia, who had just lost her husband of 25 years. And it begins with his saying, I do not preach consolation because I'm unwilling to preach at any time. And I know my own weakness too well. Acknowledging that the disturbed mind and affections, seldom calm without an intervening time of confusion and trouble, 
he advises Letitia, in a determined effort to settle the thoughts, to parcel out the day, to find occupation regularly, or to make it, to be up and doing something, which are chiefly to be found in the mere mechanical means that must come to the aid of the best mental efforts. Thus, occupational therapy. And he also adds that while it is impossible to be sure, but our prolonged grief, he suggests, for the beloved dead, may grieve them in their own unknown abiding place and give them trouble. This is on the edge of the consoling thought that the departed beloved is still in some sense alive, beyond the reach of our grieving memory, in another and better world, where, as we see so often on park benches memorialising the dead, the deceased and the bereaved will be reunited. And this profound hope is movingly expressed in Bishop King's An Exequy to the matchless, never-to-be-forgotten friend, his beloved wife. He imagines how each day will bring him nearer to her. Every hour, he says, is a step towards thee. But hark, my pulse, like a soft drum, beats my approach, tells thee I come. But there is no such consolation for infidels like your speaker. I cannot entirely follow Gertrude in her remonstration with Hamlet. Yes, all that lives must die, but its passage through nature leads not to eternity, but I fear to nothing. This pyramid of ashes truly is the final state of your speaker and those he has loved and lost. To think otherwise seems to this infidel magic thinking. And there is another difficulty that makes mourning inescapable. It's captured by the melancholic diarist H.F. Amiel in a penetrating observation. All that is necessary, he said, all that is providential, in short, unimputable, I could bear, I think, with some strength of mind. But responsibility mortally envenoms grief. And those who are bereaved find a multitude of ways of feeling guilty that prevents them moving on because their guilt troubles with them. There are obvious sources of guilt. Time and again, as a doctor, I had to reassure grieving relatives that they were not responsible for the patient's death, that it would have made no difference whatsoever if they'd noticed something earlier, acted sooner, called the ambulance, or whatever. There is the guilt, perhaps justified, at not having treated the deceased more thoughtfully, more kindly, at a selfishness that took the other one for granted and failed to admit, acknowledge, or realised her full reality. It's hard not to regret the preoccupations, duties, ambitions and achievements which created spaces in which each could forget the other for stretches of time, just in virtue of being so often in different places, in the world, in a city, in a room, their togetherness was an intermittence of being apart, something both took for granted and accept, accepted as entirely normal, which it was. No one, after all, achieves anything significant without turning their backs on those closest to them for significant periods of time. And there was, it seemed, an entirely innocent and necessary infidelity built into the very structure of the relationship. The multitude of friends, colleagues, confidants, relations, the pressure of imperatives that divide and dilute the presence of each to the other. We are distracted, drawn apart from those closest to us by the obligation to deliver on our obligations. One version of this guilt is described with exquisite precision in the agony of Thomas Hardy's beautiful and disturbing poems, 1912 to 1913, written after the sudden death of his wife. He had admittedly been estranged from her, and what's more, he didn't appreciate that she was seriously ill. In The Going, remorse is mixed with something close to resentment that she'd not warned him of her death. The last day was like any other. Why did you give no hint that night that quickly after tomorrow's dawn and calmly as if indifferent quite you would close up your term here, up and be gone, where I could not follow with wing of swallow to gain one glimpse of you ever anon? His regret that they had not revisited the early days of their marriage when they were in love is bitter indeed. Why then latterly did we not speak? Did we not think of those days long dead and ere your vanishing, strive to seek that time's renewal. He's crushed, in short, by knowledge of missed opportunity. Oh, you could not know that such a swift fleeing, no soul foreseeing, not even I, 
would undo me so. There is a realisation of an apartness that goes deeper than this. That the other can die, can be alone unaccompanied in this the most profound change, seems proof of the degree to which we are enailed in the sea of life, as Matthew Arnold put it, and how we mortal millions live alone, echoed by Schubert in his diary. People imagine they can reach one another, but in reality they only pass one another by. Oh, misery for one who realises this. It may not be true, but it's what the bereaved may feel. For bereavement is a brutal way of reinforcing awareness of the extent to which we are separate. The permanent separation by the greatest of all distances, the distance between life and death, highlights the separateness that checkers all togetherness, even in the closest and most fulfilled relationship. Behind it is the fundamental truth, no less profound for being a truism, that we are continuously ourselves and only intermittently with our closest intimate. What the other knows immediately about herself is often for us a matter of guesswork or the subject of inquiry. We de do not even know what it was like for the lost one to be in our company and how and to what extent our distinct co-presences were congruent, given the frequent and necessary divergence of preoccupations, duties, projects, anxieties, viewpoints, sensations, never mind of the final journeys that have to be taken alone. And there is something deeper at work. Thomas Hardy again. This is a memory of a happy moment in his childhood. It's called the self-unseeing. Here is the ancient floor, foot-worn and hollowed and thin. Here was the former door where the dead feet walked in. She sat here in her chair. She sat here in her chair, smiling into the fire. He who played stood there, bowing it higher and higher. Childlike, I danced in a dream. Blessings emblazoned that day. Everything glowed with a gleam. Yet we were looking away. Yet we were looking away. Looking outward, looking forward, looking backward, looking anywhere but here being anywhere but here. Hardy's child looking away is a poignant example of something woven into the very fabric of human time, of shared time and togethering. And mourning our loss, we dwell on the extent to which we fail to be entirely present in what we had before we lost it. Thus grief mortally envenomed, to use Amiel's phrase. Those who mourn may feel solitary because their sorrow is not shared or at least not felt as intensely and continuously by others who would support them. Others, after all, have their lives to get on with. And when the time comes, their, own, their mourning to do, their own memories and regrets to come to terms with. Mourners may remember with regret that they in the past have not mourned the many others whom others have mourned. The circle of those whom they value and miss is rather tightly drawn. To be bereaved is to be reminded that one is part of the heartlessness of the world. We cared a lot for some, a little for some more, and nothing for the overwhelming majority. Mournable deaths are vastly outnumbered by those that are beyond the reach of our capacity or inclination to mourn. Sustenance may, of course, come from public rituals of mourning, but there's sometimes the feeling that such public events have hollows near to the heart, that they are too general, too formalised, that they share something of remembrance service when we assert that we remember them, though in our two minutes or more of reflection, we do not even be begin to define who the remembered are, never mind give them even the fleeting posthumous life of being remembered truly. There is a sense that the performance of sorrow tinges the careful, calculated tact of kindly friends who may consequently be transformed into imperfect strangers in whose consciousness one lives an intermittent life and in whose mind there is a portrait one would not recognise. This is another way in which mourning highlights our state of being enailed, rooted in the truth that we are continuously aware of ourselves and only intermittently in the presence of others and even more intermittently aware of what they are thinking, feeling and needing, even less able to respond to those thoughts, feelings and needs. 
The widow's weeds and the black armband request special treatment, but cannot requisition imagination, empathy, or true co-presence. And finally, as a mourner, you are made aware of the fragility of your own life. The other's death is a prelude to yours. Whose turn will it be next to be taken out, to be shot? To lose the beloved is the largest step towards the inevitable loss of everything. Your life, your world, and yourself. Hamlet's protracted mourning. He hath that within which, which pathos, that within which pathos show is not pathological. It's a suitable case, it's not pathological, is not a suitable case for cognitive behavioral therapy. Even so, life has to continue. Here is Claudius. To sweet and commendable in your nature, Hamlet, to give these mourning duties to your father. But you must know your father lost a father. That father lost, lost his. And the survivor bound in filial obligation for some term to do obsequious sorrow. But to persevere in obstinate condolement is a course of impious stubbornness. Tis unmanly grief. It shows a will most incorrect to heaven. Fie, it is a fault to heaven. A fault against the dead. A fault to nature. To reason most absurd. Whose common theme is death of fathers. And who still hath cried from the first course till he that died today. This must be so. The message articulated by Claudius with increasing impatience. Get over it. Move on. If everyone behaved like you, the world would grind to a halt, is of course poisoned by the fact that we know that Claudius, the murderer of Hamlet's father, is ordering Hamlet to get over the consequences of his own crime. But it's one we recognise. Others who wish us to recover from our loss may not only be acknowledging that life would be impossible if it was entirely caught up in outliving, but also have needs of their own. So our friends perhaps grow tired of our grief, wish we would remove that black band round our life, would talk about something less than unbearable loss. The shallows of ordinary conversation prefer gossip and good cheer. Death is too dark and too big, like a shark in a rock pool. This may be reflected in the feeling experienced by those who grieve that others might wish to avoid them. A woman I knew described the experience as being the psychological equivalent of sooty, where the widow is immolated along with her husband on the funeral pyre. Or more gently, where the topic of the loss is to be avoided. I think of the friends who Julian Barnes observed in his memoir of his own bereavement, the friends who pretended not to hear when he mentioned his wife's name. For there is implicit a statue of limitation on mourning. There is a certain amount of what Freud called the work of mourning to be done. It is a process of disinvestment of the self in the lost beloved. At its heart is a cruel retraining of habits of expectation, of reference, of self-location. Yes, a disinvestment, a withdrawal from a version of oneself. Killing the pain of loss seems to diminish, to half kill, that which one has lost. To cease to miss seems to dismiss. And because the other and oneself were so inseparably intertwined, to commit at least partial suicide. It is to collude with the loss and make it complete, even to suggest that the past was a kind of dream and the present nightmare a passage to updated reality. But even so, sooner or later, life continues and extends beyond and outside the spaces expropriated by loss. Absence, the not, the no longer, <coughs> occupy shrinking territory. The period when he talked to her, except in his imagination, starts to recede, displaced by the hours, days, weeks, months, years, in which he started to talk about her. And the beloved is more often she, or your mother, or my late wife, than thou. If at length the bereaved give, them, bereaved give themselves permission to flourish again, it's in part because there are others who deserve their attention. Children, relatives, colleagues and friends. The initial, necessarily outward show of recovery gradually permeates inwards and becomes more than a show. The therapy of occupation and preoccupation does its subtle work, most effective if least noticed. There will, of course, be catastrophic relapses when the coat is hung up and the door closes on an empty and silent house, its spaces packed with evidences of the world they had created between them, or when places are visited alone that they had, they had visited together. But the trend will be set. Thus, the work of mourning. 
And since this is a philosophical meeting, we might ask what philosophers might have to say that could help us. Is there anything they could do to address our future bereaved selves? The earliest preserved sentence of Western philosophy, owing to Anaximander, tells us the score. Where things have their origin, there they must also pass away, according to necessity. For they must pay the penalty and be judged for their injustice, according to the, inord to the ordinance of time. Now this is much more than saying that in virtue of which stuff happens, stuff must also unhappen, so that everything which passes towards must pass away. It's more than even than saying that particulars have no right to be, and if they have come into being, must redeem their original sin of contingency by ceasing to be. It says, according to Heidegger's compelling interpretation, that what is present is adikon, unjust or etymologically out of joint. Time itself is out of joint. The present is a lingering that escapes both the coming to and the going away. This lingering is an insurrection on behalf of sheer endurance. An endurance that Hardy's looking away in the poem Self Unseeing is always undermined. This offers, of course, little comfort. It does, however, underline the extraordinary privilege of being, of being there, and most importantly, of having been there together. Jump forward to half a, millennia, half a millennium to a more predictable port of call, to Lucretius, De Rerum Nurtura, and the reason for not fearing death. We've had non-existence before we were born, he says, and remember nothing of it. We should not fear returning to this state. His argument is, of course, deeply flawed because it overlooks the non-equivalence of being non-existent in the first place, which feels and knows and anticipates nothing, and now anticipating non-existence, which, of course, feels much. The asymmetry, the non-equivalence, is underlined when we outlive those whom we've loved. Even if Lucretius really had helped us to come to terms with mortality, he would have had nothing to say about outliving. There's no consolation in thinking that since you loved happily without your beloved in the years before you met her, you could just as well live happily again without her. After all, you have become what you are, at least through your love for the one you have lost. You are the story of your life, and that story is shared in its most important part with the story of the life that is lost. To live without her is to live without a large part of yourself. The interface between philosophy, therapy and preaching that is exemplified in the Stoic tradition scarcely assists those who love life and whose love of life is inextricably caught up with the love of another. Spinoza's belief that insofar as we are rational, we ought to value the past, present and future equally does little to assuage sorrow. And the Spinozist Einstein's letter to the widow of his friend Michele Besso makes one shudder. Now Besso, he wrote to his widow, has departed from this strange world a little ahead of me. That means nothing. People like us who believe in physics know that the distinction between past, present and future is only a stubbornly persistent illusion. <laughs> We can only guess how much comfort Mrs. Besso got from such thoughts. <laughs> Stoic and other prescriptions may console in theory, but not when they are faced with howling reality. The truly wise Dr. Johnson reflects this in Rasselas, the allegorical novel he wrote at high speed in great grief after the death of his beloved mother, aiming thereby to pay for her funeral. Rasselas, in his journey to seek happiness, is very impressed by a philosopher preaching Stoic values but he's cautioned by Imlac, his, meta, his mentor. Be not too hasty to trust or admire the teachers of morality. They discourse like angels, but they live like men. And he soon discovers the truth of this when he visits the Stoic philosopher and finds him in a darkened house, polaxed by the death of his own daughter. What comfort, said the mourner, can truth and reason afford me? Of what effect are they now but to tell me that my daughter will not be restored. So we have all our words and attitudes in advance and find that when they are needed, the words are drained of meaning and the attitudes are not possible. The grand generalizations of philosophy don't seem to reach into those interstices of life where we encounter our losses and mourn. As Yeats put it, 
Man is in love and loves what vanishes. What more is there to say? Even so, a life without unreasonable love, without the special meaning each might have in another's eye, however little objective legitimacy he had, will be a life without full human, human meaning. And, speaking as an infidel, a universe underpinned by a god who cares for the fall of a sparrow as much as for the one whose loss you fear above all, whose love is even distributed over the entirety of his creation, including seven billion needy souls, is as comfortless as one in which no one is cared for. A world in which no one cared especially for anyone else, that each careless of his own life will be careless of other lives, would be a bleak place. Without unreasonable, preferential love, life would break down into a succession of moments. And this, though our hold on life is frail, much of living is a long, and thus, though our hold on life is frail, much of living is a long succession of farewells, small and large, with and without ceremony, and our grasp on its moments weak. We always, as Rilke said in his Duino elegies, we always retain the attitude of someone who's departing. We live our lives forever taking leave. We slip through our own fingers, and we shall lose those who share our lives. Increasingly, we are outlivers, until we ourselves are numbered among the lost. We have to find a seemingly impossible path that embraces the future without betraying the past, finding new meanings while not turning one's back on what was once new and meant everything. Time to conclude. What's to be done? In the kingdom of means, we fight to postpone death, knowing that in the eyes of eternity, the difference between being stillborn and dying as an octogenarian is scarcely perceptible. In the kingdom of contemplation, we cultivate a preemptive mourning by a foreseeing and foresuffering that may help us to rejoice in what has not yet been taken from us, which I think is the message of Montaigne and Forster. And philosophy, I haven't been fair to philosophy, because philosophy, with its wonderful problems to pinch us awake, brings here its true value. Not consolation, but astonishment, and untaking the taken for granted, helping us to see. This, of course, falls far short of detachment from persons, places and things that would protect us from mourning. But it is a love, is philosophy. It's a love not of wisdom, who after all is wise, but a special kind of love of the world, a respect for its mystery, possibly for its tragedy, and certainly for its complexity. Thus philosophy is its best, truly humane philosophy. And if indeed there is an art of outliving, it must be inseparable from that aspect of the art of living expressed perfectly by Shakespeare, speaking this time in his own voice, to love that well which thou must leave ere long. Thank you.